Welcome. I am Andrus Kolekauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Today, I'm giving a presentation to our friends and guests, um, physicist Thomas Gaidosik, mathematician John Harland, and a technical writer and facilitator John Brett. Our subject for today is about teamwork in creating learning paths. So I'll share my screen right now and um, talk about the learning paths of math for wisdom, how they fit together. The crucial thing I'm trying to learn um, is how to work as a team to make uh, videos and learning materials that um, make sense, you know, and for them to make sense, uh, they uh, need to be understood by people. Uh, they need to, you know, and so people need to be able to learn from them. So I need to be able to target them. Uh, people need to understand uh, what this is about. And I need to understand what they understand and what they don't do. Kirby, explain this teamwork. Now, I've been sharing most recently my Bucky stuff and my Wittgenstein stuff on Andreas uh, Kulikowskis' um, free list, right? Because he's got his new, um, Andreas Kulikowskis has got his Math for Wisdom website, which has been very active and has included a lot of YouTubes. He's prolific like I am. So sometimes I have trouble keeping up, but it's not like we're doing everything in real time. So it's not like I have to keep up with everything in real time. Same with you guys, right? First of all, it's very helpful, I'm discovering, to talk with people of different um, knowledge background, uh, including uh, on some things, um, Let's say John knows mathematics that uh, I don't know or I don't understand. Thomas certainly knows physics I don't understand and related mathematics. Uh, uh, John Brett uh, has skills, as I said, as a technical writer and facilitator, but also I may be teaching uh, John Brett uh, various uh, things. And so I need to know, uh, also with John and Thomas, like, am I being understood? Am I making sense? Uh, these learning paths um, have different entryways. What I would like to talk about and what we'll start with is uh, in blue, I think you can see, there's this equation here, 120 degrees plus 120 degrees equals 90 degrees. So why don't I just try to focus on that? Why would that be important? And um, I come in peace and friendship with beautiful truth. Dido, Doddle, you call this A2 because it has two simple roots. This one, this one, 120 degrees. And you call this one A3 because it has three simple roots. This one, this one, this one. And do you see in A3 that these two are 120 degrees apart? And these two are 120 degrees apart. But these two are 90 degrees apart. Because 120 degrees plus 120 degrees equals 90 degrees. I made this model to show you, but you should make it yourself. But if you've been following this channel, Coffee Shops Network and Trucker Exchange are two of the major projects that I brainstorm about. You could call it science fiction. You could call it investment banking. It's up to you. Science fiction is where we storyboard the future and that's why martian math and science fiction go together so much and martian math is my what do you want to call it wrapper like uh like gift wrapper for gift wrapping for synergetic geometry which is the bucky stuff the dinkin diagram a3 has three nodes which stand for 
three dimensions. Two, three. The middle node is connected to this dimension by 120 degrees. And this edge also stands for 120 degrees, and it connects these two dimensions. However, this dimension does not have a direct connection to this dimension. They are independent, which means they are separated by 90 degrees. This is our equation, 120 degrees plus 120 degrees equals 90 degrees. This is the link in all of Dinkin diagrams, no matter how long they are. Something that came up today talking with Thomas is the difference between math for wisdom and uh, math for fascination or math for uh, inspiration, let's say, or math for curiosity. Um, many people are attracted uh, to beautiful things in math, like um, the exceptionally groups uh, E6, E7, E8, or uh, the Octonians, or uh, the Leech Lattice, uh, Leech Lattice, and things like that. I'm trying to focus specifically on that mathematics, which um, matches cognitive frameworks. And so these cognitive frameworks that are fitting into a language. So one of the exciting things has been talking with uh, John Brett. Uh, uh, he and his wife, uh, Yoshimi, have um, worked on a cognitive framework um, or, or conceptual structure uh, that uh, they're developing with emergently. Now, maybe, John, could you talk about that a little bit, how you understand that, what that is? Yeah, um, sure. Well, emergently is really about the idea of letting go of what, of having desires, ego, and thinking, what does the system need? Um, and it's a very unusual way of thinking. I mean, we don't normally do that. We normally think, well, what's what's my desired outcome? And then how can I get there with as little damage as possible? Um, and that's how we've got most of civilization has got to this point in time. Um, but now we've got to a point where, you know, the climate's telling us that's not working anymore. Um, we have to think more about the whole system um, and less about what I personally want. Even even my desires, very empathetic, um, you know, desires for the world world peace, for example. Well, maybe world peace isn't a, isn't a good idea. Who knows? Um, so to let go of that desire and so it let things, let your plans emerge gently or let the solutions emerge gently. And we've gone back to the simple, simplest possible system, which is a tetrahedron, a three-sided pyramid with a triangular base. So it's got four sides and they're all equal. And using that as a metaphor to try and explore how we can think and using using metaphor all the time to distract the brain from linear thinking of where's what's my desire how do i get there in a straight line so the situ thank you and so the situation is that um i'm an independent thinker since childhood i've been motivated you know to know everything apply that usefully i've had this uh, reason to uh pursue absolute truth as a way of agreeing, you know, or understanding what's being said, uh, I've developed the language of cognitive frameworks, uh, which I think, like, or more accurately, maybe I've documented a language of cognitive frameworks, which I think, you know, expresses that. And uh, that is a very fringe activity. So uh, I have a PhD in mathematics as part of those studies. And so what I'm trying to show to validate and clarify that and to apply that is that these frameworks, I claim, um, do actually arise in practice of mathematicians. So, for example, um, I talk about uh, divisions of everything, and I've made uh, videos about that. And so I'm trying to say, oh, uh, you can see in red here, it says exact sequences here on the left. So exact sequences are a very important tool, and they carve up um, space. 
Um, they kind of carve up a certain type of mathematical space between an incoming zero and an outgoing zero. And that the number of maps I claim uh, seems to fit well with the number of perspectives in a cognitive framework. So an example would be um, grad curl div is a is an exact sequence or a chain complex, uh, which would have, uh, these are three maps. There'd be two more trivial maps. It'd be five maps in all. And I'm saying that that's, uh, I'm arguing uh, that that is uh, the modeling, the uh, structure whereby for decision-making with five perspectives, whereby every effect has had its cause looking backwards and not every cause has had its effect looking forwards and there's a critical point for deciding. So, so there are these pathways where certain things might be rather um, simple, like the binomial theorem, I don't know if you're familiar with, but like where you have Pascal's triangle, but there might be a version of that that's more sophisticated, like the Gaussian binomial coefficient, where you have uh, counting subspaces uh, of a vector space when you have a finite field. And it just goes up and up. And so there's certain peaks that we'd like to climb, like bot periodicity has an eight cycle uh, periodicity, which I suspect matches what I've observed for these divisions of everything. That's a huge challenge. Um, Similarly, like I, I suspect that there's four geometries, affine, projective, conformal, symplectic. And so I'm trying to show that if we can climb these learning paths, we can get there. Of course, I don't understand these things. So it's a challenge how to show this progression, you know, and share information like mountain climbers uh, on these learning paths um, when uh, I don't know myself. So one of the things I'm learning in building a team that's emerging, let's say, is how to do that. Another uh, issue is that... Uh, I have my map of learning paths. Why would people, let's say Kirby Erner is also in the Buckminster Fuller uh, tetrahedron community. He has a different, um, just a epistemological approach. You know, he doesn't, let's say, have a need for absolute truth. Uh, and secret meanings or secondary meanings or occult meanings or non-literal interpretation. Synergetics, for those who don't know, uses all kinds of STEM vocabulary and concepts, but it doesn't mind being metaphorical. Whereas traditional science writing, except for psychology pretty much, treasures literal truth. That's the kind of truth they like the most. Whereas some of us elitist humanities people, we sneer at literal truth. That's like the most dumbest kind, right? And if there is absolute truth, it's certainly not literal. How could it be? That's so crass. But that's just being, I guess, snobbish or something. You know, or like John Brett talks about metaphors, right? So um, I guess what I'm trying to, that's maybe just to stop right here and say that's my challenge, is uh, how can, what does it take for us to work together, even we might be from different religious points of view, mathematically, so to speak. Does anybody have any comments on that? So why don't I uh, show, this is an example of what well, I'm trying to well, show. It's a, tall, it's, a, it's a very tall order because, I mean, you're, you're, um, you're kind of amalgamating, you know, very broad knowledge here, you know, which has always been difficult um, for, <laughs> for thinkers to do, right? It's, you know, there tends to be specialization. We know our, our little piece of that, that map that you just showed, but right. You know, trying to trying to bring it all together like that is, I think, quite a monumental undertaking. And so, so, so some people were born to do monumental undertakings, maybe fail, right? Most people somehow, that's just not what their life is about, you see. And so uh, uh, maybe they're falling in love, you know, maybe they're raising a family, you know, maybe they have, a, you know, serving society somehow. So, uh, or creating wars, you know, they have, they have things to do. So, how do we work together uh, despite that, right? And so I just found it very, so here's an example of a picture I'm trying to show. I'm trying to show that geometrically, there's a very unique and crucial and key thing going on here that if you take like a cube, you know, and or any object like here, there's a way of rotating it 120 degrees, then rotating 120 degrees again, and you'll end up with a 90 degree change. It turns out this 90 degree change uh, is a reflection, I think. It's more obvious with a cube. Um, I wish I had a cube with me. I, uh, maybe I'll figure something out. Well, 
Whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't need no Martian fiddle faddle to do all that. We got cubes. I got my tumbling cube. Now here's how we do it. Set the cube on an edge. It's gonna be 90 degrees, right angle. We do a two step back around and a two step upside down. And there you have it. It's everything, it's a right angle. And you can see perfectly, there's no rotation. No, it's a reflection. Now let me show you this movement that I'm familiar with. And this is all about the one third rotation because we got three faces, 120 degrees. So we're gonna start right here. And this move is called the turn and the roll. That's 120 degrees. And I go turn and roll. Another 120 degrees. And then I turn, roll, and look at that. Back where I started. I started and I got back three times, 120 degrees. But, um, and so I showed this to John and he kind of, you know, was able to criticize this a little bit. Like it's, you know, this is a, the diagram you can criticize. Like, is this really 90 degrees? Are these really 120 degrees, 120 degrees, right? That comes up clearly. And how do I, what do I need to do to show that they are? Well, how do I know that you end up with 90 degrees? I say we're going to resolve this with a, Mathematics. Do you mean math for wisdom? Well, sure. I believe I do. You can start explaining this Dinkin diagram, A3. Unfortunately, I do not find it obvious how you get 120 degrees. A cube is square. A square suffers rotations of 90 degrees. How can that yield rotations by one third? I'm going to now show you another thing. This is how you get 120 degrees plus 120 degrees. What's that going to be? You turn and then you roll. Okay. And I'm going to roll and I'm going to turn. Hey, hey. Look what happened there. I was, this was over here and it got back up there. That's 90 degrees. See, it made a 90 degree angle where it was and where it became. But that was no rotation. You see, that was a reflection. I don't know any Martian can do that. You see, this reflected up there. It was down here. And it reflected up there. Right? Any comments on this? Or? I mean, with basic mass, you can just put the axis that you show into certain parts of a cube say what they mean middle midpoints of edges and then you can algebraically show that you have the 120 120 degree angle and what you get out is that you have a 90 degree angle between two of the axes that you show here so okay. I have it works out yeah. just algebraically Right. So, and I think maybe that's a nice thing that shows the value of math. Like, you know, math validates, right? Because our eyes are going to be a little bit skeptical. Here's another view, you know, mm -hmm. where it's 120, that seems believable. Then it says it's 120 dipping down. And then it's 90 degrees um, 
going up. You know, can you believe it or not? Right? Like, what would it take to believe that? Um, yeah, I think there's there's one important thing if you go back to that picture, and that is um, if you if you were actually building this in a in a um, in a sequence. So you start off with a, a three straight st sticks and you and you cross them. Mm -hmm. uh, you think, okay, we'll have a horizontal line, and I want to make 120 degrees. Well, that's two two sixty. So if I do one like this and another one like this, um, so I end up with a three three sixty degrees. I can see how you can get you know, uh, and then you break off mm -hmm. uh, the ones you're not interested in. So you just end up with the 120 degree angle on the top um, and then you you want to or you bend one of the horizontal ones down 120 degrees but here's the critical thing that people haven't noticed that's not enough you've got to twist it around 30 degrees mm -hmm. why is that so it's not in the same that the bottom ones the tripod is not in the same plane as the so horizontal true. and it's not at 90 degree plane Oh, show so what, maybe, what, maybe what show is it then? So I just want to show, and our time is running out, but I just want to show, uh, these are the Dinkin diagrams. This is why we're doing it. You can see there's this classification of all the n-dimensional spaces, but basically everything almost looks the same. Almost everything is of the form of these building blocks, a node like this, or an edge like this, or two edges. How do we know that? because of the Dinkin diagrams. They are the treasure maps of geometry. They draw the root systems of the complex, simple Lie algebras, the complexifications of the real Lie algebra of the real connected compact Lie groups, including the compact classical groups, which are key to all of geometry. You got the affine geometry, projective geometry, conformal geometry, oh, and symplectic geometry. We're going to figure out these Dinkin diagrams and round up all of the geometry. And it turns out that when you have these nodes, like here, if two nodes are connected, they're related by 120 degrees. So each node is like a pair of arrows. They call them roots you know, in one direction or another, and they get encoded like x sub 2 minus x sub 1. The opposite would be x sub 1 minus x sub 2. It's kind of like you go from 2 to 1 or you go from 1 to 2. Now, if that's a one-dimensional. If you have two dimensions, in it, that's almost like a one-dimensional axis, I guess, you know, is a, maybe a way to think of it. I'm not sure. I have to learn better. If you have this one, this is a, and this is a SU, this is SL2, which becomes SU2 if you uh, take it, um, if you play with it a little bit. For SL3, you would now have two dimensions. And so you have like a, an X3 that you throw in. So you get X3 minus X2, you get X3 minus X1. If you add these two, X3 minus X2 plus X2 minus X1, you add the vectors, you get this. And they have their negatives as well, okay? And then when you have, but you can see that the there's a 120 degree angle here, which is crucial for building this little system. And then here you have 120 degrees and 120 degrees, but if they're disconnected, that's considered 90 degrees. So that's what I'm trying to illustrate. Like Kirby will talk about, and so these diagrams are showing like 120 degrees, you know, or like a tetrahedral is very important, but you can't say that a cube and 90 degrees are not important because everything. Everything that's not connected is related by 90 degrees. So the question is, is like, if you link and then you link, somehow you got unlinked, right? It, it became not related anymore. And so what's happening here, you can kind of see the structure. This structure here, if you take a cube and you put it on its point, and you'll see like a zigzag go up and down six times, that'll be, and you just 
cut the cube in half, like you will see that uh, you will see this. Yeah. I want to show you another thing, what I do with my machete. See, I can disassemble this. Look at the edges. Look at the edges. There's 12 of them, right? So when you have a vertex, there's three edges come together. Look at the midpoints. That's midpoint, that's midpoint, that's midpoint, right? And there's three more on the other side. Three more on the other side. And there's six left, and they're all around the middle. Now, it looks like they're going up and down, like a wigwam. But no. If you cut it in half like that, if you just chop it in half, yeah. That'll be all in the same plane. Don't you see? It's in the same plane. And then this top will get off. And this top will fall down the bottom. And they can come together. But they'll be like a hexagon right in the middle. Because we've got the vertex on top, vertex on bottom. That's how it's assembled. I just love it. Yeah. Now, if you want to make it three-dimensional, you need to add an X4. And now you'll have three points, let's say, on top. And then you'll have, I put them in red, let's say, and then you'll, the minuses will go down blue. And so they'll go in all the gaps. You'll have three going on these gaps, and then the alternating gaps go down, you see? So that explains, like, you get a tripod on top, you get a tripod on the bottom, you have a six. But if you see, there are 12 roots in this root system, and three go up, and three go down, and six go all around. Now, if you want to think in cubes, I don't know why, but if you want, you can think that these are where the midpoints of the edges would be. And they would go up and down and up and down and up and down and back up. That's how they would be. And then if you look like this, you can see the symmetry, sixfold, but you can see that the three on top go in between in one way every 120 degrees, and the three on the bottom go in the gaps also 120 degrees, and they fill the whole system. Now, if you look at one cross-section, so let's say you only look at X4, X2, X1, you're going to get the same star you had before, but you're going to get a, it'll be, I think you mentioned, like, it'll be rotated, you know, it'll be, it'll be uh, lean down. So I should be very clear about that, not to confuse anybody. But look at these yellow ones. You see? there will be six, so it will pick up, these two axes will pick up these two, and then on the other side, these two on the bottom one, the yellow one and the purple one, always picking up two on top, two on bottom, and two in the middle. So if we turn this, this these two on top, and then those two on the bottom, and then these two in the middle, and I turn it again, I pick up these two on top, these two on the bottom, this one in the middle. I can do these two on top, those two on the bottom, this one in the middle. So there's three ways to pick two on top, and you'll get two on the bottom and one in the middle. There's three ways to pick one in the middle. There's basically three ways to have it leaning, kind of like a drunken leaning. Or dancing, maybe, is nicer to say. They're dancing. Dancing. And so, there's also one, if you chop it this way. So, this one and these three means there's four ways. Because there's four axes. When you have a cube, but you don't have to think about a cube. But when you have a cube, you have eight vertices. And between those vertices, you have four axes. So these are the four axes. Yes. If you want to go back to this, let's say, you can see that, let's say, this yellow one 
and this purple one are on the bottom, and these axes will be related to them. And then imagine that they get leaned over on top, right? Does that make sense? So every time you have an axis, there'll be two in front of it, let's say, and there'll be two leaned back, right? Uh, and so that'll be, um, that'll be a star, but it'll be lean, like a drunken kind of like leaning, right? So a tetrahedra will have like four ways of, uh, it'll have three ways of leaning and it'll have one flat one, let's say. You can build this in a cube. Uh, you can look at it as two tetrahedrons. I have different models. Now, we've been thinking about this here. Like you see, it's a tetrahedron coming down on top, tetrahedron coming down on the bottom. But it's really a cube, right? Now we have questions about that. But I'll tell you, the easy way to think about it is a cube has eight what? Eight vertices. Yeah. And so if you got eight vertices, the tetrahedron has four vertices. And we got two tetrahedrons. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah. That's why we have eight vertices. So if you put a cube on the vertex here, and there's going to be a vertex on the other side. And remember, we have the threefold symmetry, right? Yeah, threefold, right? So that's how the vertex is. But if you if you take it and you say, now how could that be a cube, right? How could that be a cube? How could it? But if you go like that, yeah, don't you see it? And so I'm going to show it is a cube because I got my square, you know, because I belong to the cubic earth society and we all get our squares. Yeah. Don't you got your square? Yeah. So then we go like this. Yeah, that looks good. That looks like a good square. Does it all line up for you there? Can you see it? Can you see it like that? I hope so. That looks good. Yeah, that's cute. Yeah. So maybe uh, we'll be knocked off quick, but uh, any comments at this point? Is this helpful or not? Or what do we need here? The, the one um, comment I would make is that if you're talking about points, then a single point by itself, or how you see me, <laughs> is uh, zero dimensions, and two points is one dimension. Um, and three points makes well okay but not not in this language in this language you see this is one dimensional so we have to learn the language right sure so in in in, in that, that, language. That, that you're not talking about you know the normal comprehension of dimensions no. but well but i think john's comment is completely correct i mean you need two vectors to have a one-dimensional relation you need x1 and x2. For the next one, you get a plane because you have three points or three directions, three roots. Well, and only with four roots, you the get point. the three dimensions. Well, this is two dimensional. This is three dimensional. That's all I'm saying. Yes. One, three. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and the dimensions are, well, the, 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 the dimensions are given by these root systems. These root systems are coding up these matrices. So like... Mm -hmm. Uh, when you have a Lie algebra, uh, SL, it's matrices, so, and it's just adding things, but the diagonal will be... Here our Zoom session so ended, corner, but there's have, one more thing I want to show you. I have been working with physical models, but I want to show a um, 3D diagram that I created using 3D diagram online uh, tool called Math3D, which is found at math3d.org. It's a, uh, I'm very grateful for this uh, tool because uh, it's free. And um, furthermore, it's possible to uh, share this tool's uh, results um, without any restriction. So I want my creative work in the public domain. Other tools require that it be under a uh, restrictive license, like non-commercial, uh, possibly share alike, you know, which conflicts with the public domain. So I'm very grateful to the creator for that at uh, math3d.org. And I want to show, first of all, um, this is the root system A3 placed within a cube. 
So just to review, uh, a cube has eight corners. There's four on top and four on bottom. And it has 12 edges. So there's four edges around on top, four edges around on bottom, and then four going up and down. And it has uh, six faces. Uh, there's one on top, one on the bottom, and four going around. So those are the basic symmetries. Now, when we carve it up, um, one of the things, so one of the relations with the root systems is that uh, we look at the vectors from the origin to the centers of the um, edges. So there will be 12 of them. So there's 12 um, roots, uh, or, or you could say vectors. And the roots come in pairs. And that means that there's six axes. And so uh, if we want to look at the symmetries, uh, there's different symmetries that pop out. You can see I've grouped uh, that uh, the ones, there's a middle layer here in black and blue, and that's uh, four vectors, that's two axes. And so you can see that uh, because it's cutting the cube in half this way, those are 90 degrees between the blue and the black, right? And actually, uh, if you looked at any way of, uh, so if we looked at it this way, you could see we get also 90 degrees by pairing up um, some of the greens with some of the reds, right? And we could um, we could get uh, the black and the blue with the green and the red paired like that in 90 degrees. So there's different ways of uh, getting that symmetry. Now, if we look at it at a corner, then we see um, that Coming from the corner, it brings together three faces. One on the bottom here, one on the right, and one on the left. And since it brings together three faces, uh, we'll be getting 120 degrees as we go around. And we'll see that uh, some of the vectors fall within the gaps. So basically, every 30 degrees, there will be a vector. And so 30 times 12 is 360. So we're getting... Uh, 360 degrees, um, we're getting out all the, all the vectors, all the roots. Now, one of the, um, so one of the ways that we're interested in looking is to try to get this uh, six-fold uh, symmetry. And so here we see, I guess if we look dead on at an edge, so that means that we're looking down through one of the uh, axes, right? If we look dead on the edge, then we'll get um, then we'll get these to line up. So maybe my model is a little bit off because uh, I'm not getting any in the gaps. That's curious. Whereas if I look at a corner, oh, that's how my model worked. My model didn't have uh, you know it, a cor coronal has uh, would be looking out into the center. So that's the way I was building it, right? And then you would get, if you look carefully, you would see there's three on top, and then there would be, so that'd be these three. Then there'd be one, two, three, four, five, six going around. And then these three little ones in back would be at the, at the back. So that was the view I was emphasizing with the Martians, Dotto. Um, Here's another view. You can see actually the 45 degrees also. So one of the things to realize, uh, because, you know, how does this navigate all of these different symmetries? And the point is, is that uh, uh, you choose how to break it up. So if there's 12, we can break it up into three groups of four. And so if we slash it across the middle in this way, we will get... Um, like two blue and two black, and that'll have that 90 degree uh, angles uh, going around. But then we'll get two more uh, foursomes, you know, where, or crisscrosses, but they'll be leaning, you know, or dancing. Um, they'll be, and they'll be leaning in opposite directions, right? Because uh, they'll be taking up these edge points at the top corner and then at the bottom corner or likewise here at the top, and the red one here at the bottom. So that's how they need to fit together. But the cube is uh, completely symmetric, so it's really just a matter of how we choose to color it, right? Like if we chose to color um, 
we could choose to group together this green one and that red one. And then, then below here, you'd have to group, well, they're opposites. And we could choose to group this green one and this red one, for example. Okay, so you get the same breakdown. You just choose how to color it. Uh, you get the same angles. So why don't we um, see uh, how we go from 120 to 120 to 90. Maybe I just want to add um, what's happening here, uh, how we label things. So uh, a simple way to label is to give each of the corners of the cube the labeling plus or minus one, plus or minus one, plus or minus one. Okay, and then there'll be eight ways to do that because it's two times two times two. Then the edges, and so you could say it's the center of the of the vertices, the center of these corners. Then you look at the edges, there's 12 edges, and uh, the centers of the edges, which is what we're using here, that would be given by plus or minus one, comma, plus or minus one, comma, zero. So there's three ways you could place the zero. And then uh, there's two times two is four ways of having the plus or minus sign. So there'd be 12 of that. So those are the centers, the edges. Now we could also look at the faces. Like I said, there's six faces. And so we can, um, the, the faces will be given by plus or minus one, comma, zero, comma, zero. So there's then uh, three ways where you could put the plus or minus one times two, three times two is six. Okay, and that'd be the center of the faces. And then there's one way to have the center of the whole thing. And then that would be that, which is the center of the volume. That'd be right here in the in the origin. That'd be a zero comma zero comma zero. There's only one way to do that. So uh, that's how we do that. And then we can use the uh, angle uh, rule, uh, the cosine rule for calculating angles. And we can also see... If we were to look at this dead on here, so let's say we're going to focus looking through the, uh, let's see, let me choose here. Okay, I know what I want to do. You see, let's, let's have the black one on top. Right? What we want to show, we want to show that the blue and the black are 90 degrees, and we can get that by doing a 120 degree rotation and then another 120 degree rotation. So let's say that this, let's notice, let's say, we're looking at here, um, maybe like this, dead on like that. And so up on top is this black and this green and this red, right? And now the blue one is flat in the plane. And it's part of this star, this diddle, um, blue, green, red, blue, green, red, correct? And so what's going to happen now is that uh, if I start with the blue, let's say, and I turn 120 degrees around to this red, okay? And now I can turn the 120 degrees, so now, I go from this red to this red to this black. That's another 120 degrees down a different star, right? And that would be coming back up here on the red one, right? So there's a red star here. Uh, red, red, black, red, red, black. And so if I go on that star, I'll get up at blue, black. And see, so I'll, I'll have gone from blue to black. So blue took me, there was like a mixed star. Blue, green, red, blue, green, red, and I was on that mixed star right here. And I traveled along it, and then I got onto the red star. It goes red, red, black, okay? So it's still uh, rather mind-boggling, but I think it's just becoming maybe more um, familiar, perhaps, uh, maybe more believable, maybe more accurately visualized how that's happening. I like your diddle, and I like your daddle. I'm sorry. I admit that I was wrong. Diddle daddle ain't no fiddle faddle. Who says God doesn't play with things?
dice. You a twirl your diddle, and you twirl your daddle. I go uh, two step back around, two step upside down to my tumbling dice. I will study your tumbling dice. We kind of surrendered our ability to be social engineers. In fact, that very term is demonized because it's a little bit too close to what we actually would need, isn't it? Then we'll understand math for wisdom. Did you like this exploration? Well, like this video. Do you have something to say? Well, leave a comment. Do you want to see us again? Hit the subscribe button. You're a supportive person. Support us through Patreon. Thank you from Math for Wisdom.